John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. Well, it was a lousy, terrible, awful election season, but one man was very, very happy. Him, Ted Trimpa, who orchestrated every victory there's ever been on the left. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of many. But... Just one of many. All right, so, so let me ask you, did the night go as you envisioned, or was it a whole lot better from your point of view? A whole lot better. A whole lot better. Really? Than what, what did you thought. envision, and then what was it? I envisioned that we would win. I didn't think we'd win all the statewide offices, but I thought that the races that we were going to win were going to be by one or two points, and I didn't think we would win all five of the competitive state senate races. That was a surprise. And when you look at the turnout of unaffiliated, how you know, it was a double-digit difference compared to 2014. Youth turnout was 10 percent higher than 2014. There were a lot of really upset suburban women. Seriously. And those, those are only the ones I've asked out. The, um, <laughs> let, me, let me, for people who don't understand, you have been a Democratic consultant for uh, a number of years. And what you've done differently is to bring these disparate groups on the left together and, and said, if we all win, if Dems win, we all get our agenda. Yeah. And so, really, if we got rid of you, we could save <laughs> the state. This no, is from my point of view. Yeah. Yeah, no, there are many. No, there's many, not. Many, no, many, there's not many. many. All right, so talk to me a little bit. Of, let, let's let's go down the list. Okay, sure. Um, I remember you telling me that Polis was going to be the nominee and Polis was going to win. The only worry you had at the time was Cynthia Kaufman, and I remember us yep. talking about it. And that was that was the only worry you had. Yeah, and that era that of Me out? Too, yep. an era of Me Too. I it, it could have still been competitive. I still think Jared would have won. Really? Uh, particularly given the environment and the fact that he spent the amount of money that he spent. Could Jared have won if he didn't self-fund? Yes. Be honest. No, seriously, he, 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 he can. One, he's a really good politician. Two, the, he r literally ran textbook. It was, he, he, it was spot on, It was a tight on, campaign. There was no question. It was, a, it was a very tight campaign. Of course, he was running against a campaign that's what, what campaign? I'm convinced even if... Walker's campaign did everything right. Um, I don't think the uh, I don't think it would have made much difference. I think this was particularly this was in this year. environment. Particularly in this environment. I in worry. Colorado too. I mean, I th I think it's more dis demonstrable in terms of how much Trump is disliked, and because the Republican Party. I mean, what is the Republican Party here? They've got to figure out who they are. You know, there's the Trump world. There's the establishment. They don't talk to each other, and as long as that happens. We're, we'll, we'll keep playing off of that, and we'll keep winning. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Really appreciate it. The, I worry now with campaign finance laws, and thank your team for making all that happen, that really only rich guys are the ones who are going to be winning big races. The, the days of, of Bill Owens and, and Dick Lamb, I think, are, are over. How can any one person be able to get this done? Or let me put it another way, if you do get enough money into your race to run for governor, it's money you can't control. That That's is, true. it is PACs and C4s and independent expenditure committees. So what Jared had, which is, is a dream for, for most candidates, is he got to run his own campaign. And that just doesn't happen. Uh, that's very true. And we're starting to see that that is more and more of a problem. Because in the early days of soft money, so this is the money spent outside of a campaign, the candidate, particularly after the election, was very attracted to who spent money for them um, because it was relatively something new and that kind of incentivized even more spending. And now it's become so common and kind of detached. You're seeing a rise now of individual candidate fundraising and how there's a value to that and how there's a value to being close to the candidate. So I actually think we're going to see an evolution of this over time. But until you get rid of Buckley saying that spending money is free speech, there's no way to control money in politics, even with campaign finance limitations. All you're going to do is make the well, problem, what, what, problem well, my, worse. My point is that now you have rich guys who can run their campaigns against 
maybe a well-to-do guy who can't run his own campaign, only some other rich guy can run it from behind without any coordination. There will always be an advantage now sure. for, for, for the Donald Trumps and the, there, and the um, uh, Jared Polis. There would have to be something done, and this is something you're probably not going to like, that provides some public money to at least give some chance of a, a more level playing field. There and was an opportunity with Amendment 75 to, to do that, and your guy even endorsed it. It got killed. killed. Well, I think there's an, a different idea that's out there that I think we need to look at, and it's more of a market-based approach, which you may have a little bit of interest in, and that is rather than setting up government standards for when you, uh, you know, become a candidate and then certain things you have to do in order to get money and then have limitations about how the other person's supposed to spend, why not say every registered voter gets a gift card that's like $50, $100, and candidates compete for it. Yeah, it's, so, it's called a vote. <laughs> we already have that. And they do spend that money. All right, let, 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 let's go. I don't think many people were surprised by um, uh, the vote on, on Polis. George Brockler's race was what many Republicans were holding on. Here's, here's yeah, a guy. And we always thought what would happen is Walker's race, the, the establishment would look at that and say, listen, we're not going to win. So we're going to pour all of our money into the AG race. And money was poured in, but a lot of it came really late. And I actually think what happened with Walker's race and also with Brockler's race is there was like this expectation that the Republican Governors Association is going to spend all this money, save the day. The Republican AG's Association is going to spend all this money and save the day. And then we'll kind of come up behind with some type of campaign. I mean, did you see the ads that they ran in the beginning? I mean, that one Scrabble ad, they don't even know how to play Scrabble. Um, and it, that's not how campaigns work today. Tell me, how do campaigns work today? You keep talking about ads. Ads are, are important. They set a tone. But ads are so less important now than they have ever been. Voter contact. Voter contact, voter contact, voter contact. Particularly with mail ballots. Because you know who got a ballot. You know who's turned in a ballot. So then you know which door to go to. And when you're going to that door, you need to know what to talk about to that voter. It's not just, hey, here's a door hanger. Have you turned in your ballot? Now, you, you, I'm sure you read what I wrote for the Denver Post, which was just that, which is, and Republicans don't have that yet. We think we have that, well, part but of we it, don't have the manpower, we don't have the analytics, and we don't have the money to make those things happen, particularly the I would, I would argue, actually, the, the bigger problem you have is you reinvent the wheel on this every campaign cycle. Yeah. It's like, okay, so how are we going to do voter contact? Well, let's basically pull out the same kind of plan that you had last election cycle. You think, well, maybe our universe is a little bit bigger. We're going to spend our money. This is something you have to do almost year-round. And there's a way to do this with a mix of political money you and philanthropic money. You don't understand my team. My team gets excited You're maybe six months before an election, certainly 90 days before, and then after election, they go back into hiding and don't build the infrastructure. I would argue your team is more about wanting to prove they're right rather than wanting to win. If the, if the objective is winning, winning, it changes so many different metrics. I mean, that sounds really simple, but you know, you really think about it. It, it can't be about, oh, well, if we get this, we're going to get these three policies. If we get this, then this is what we can do. It, there's, everybody, there's has also, to, everybody has to check that at the door. There's also a, a rich guy disease that my team has, which is, which is, I'm the rich guy, I got the check. You know what, you know what argument I know will get voters out is this. <laughs> if only we do a commercial that shows this, then that's what's going to get it out. And that's not how they built their businesses. They built their businesses by finding what their customers want and giving them exactly what it is. But when it comes to politics, uh, particularly Republican rich guys, they know better than everybody else. And, and Well, I have a bit of advice for Republicans. Hey, why don't you try coming to the 21st century? And when they come to the 21st century, what are they going to notice that's different? Yes, it takes money to win. And, you know, an ideology matters. But I think it's more about, it's like consumers. You're telling them, we're going to give you something that you want. But also, we're going to let you know who the people are that are representing you and have that happen over and over and over. It's not just something that happens in campaign season. And also, we had the benefit of a wave. I mean, I always thought we were going to win by one or two. 
never thought, particularly in the state Senate seats, that we would win by double digits in all five. Yeah, well, before we go to that, let's, let, let's talk about the things that really were heartbreaking for me. One was Wayne Williams, who was, by all means, one of the you know, most competent attorney generals in, in uh, excuse me, uh, secretary of state in, in, in the country. He was endorsed by every single newspaper except a radical weekly up in Boulder. So he loses. Not only that, we've got Mike Kaufman, who has been able to fight off these fights for a decade. Right. When he's supposed to lose, he's supposed to lose, and supposed to lose. This one was no different. Both of these losses, I think, are, are just complete Trump losses. Am I, I misreading that? I completely agree. No, I completely agree. You know, but for that, I think the two would have won. Say that Wayne, again, because I want, I want people to hear that. No, but for, Trump. For, yeah, but for that, the two would have won. And would, would Brockler have won as well? I actually don't think so, and I think one of the advantages that we had was Weiser had a primary campaign, and I think he very smartly did a lot of media during the primary campaign because he had to build up, you know, because he's running against a Salazar. It wasn't Ken Salazar, but some voters may not have known that. And so, and who knew Phil Weiser? And I tell you, by the end of the primary season, you knew that there was a guy named Phil Weiser, and I think he benefited going into the general election of having, having that came kind of name ID. Then when you had RAGA, the Republican um, AG's Association, do such a crappy job in terms of trying to help Brockler, and they really didn't have a campaign up and running until late, uh, by then the trend line was just too much for them to beat, and then you add in the Trump effect. The, the um, outside money with RAGA is the same sort of thing I'm talking about, that even if they hit it on the head with, a, with an idea, this is the message that'll work, they stumble. I remember four years ago with Hickenlooper, it was the Republican Governors Association that had this great thing on the Chuck E. Cheese killer, yeah. but they got it wrong. It was, I think, a right issue, right. but they were tone deaf to what happens in this state. My sense is if, if Beaupre's people were in charge of it, it might have gone done differently. Anyway, well, back, back to and, that and, issue. So on that, the difference, again, uh, between Democrats and Republicans on this, for us, we have DGA just like Republicans have RGA. But any player of outside money has to play within our structure. There's no, you come in on your own, you do, do you the messaging that, that you want. Let me ask you, because I, I understand years of, your, your... Years of relationships, years. Your method of bringing the rich guys in, there's, there's two things. One, the rich guys come in and the interest groups come in and they talk about what is it gonna to take to win yep. and they leave, they leave a lot of agendas at the door. All agendas at the door. Secondly, they hand off a lot of the work to professionals but not consultants. And I, I, I put you proudly in that, in that category of consultants make money every time a commercial is, is aired because right. they take a percentage of, of it. They make money every time a mailer goes out. And so it's, it's like um, you know, going to a doctor and, his, and you know, he's a chiropractor. Let me tell you, everything he sees, well, the treatment is going to be the same because <laughs> he makes his money off of it. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, about contractors. The left has really stopped paying these absorbent amounts of money for the consultant class. Tell, in, talk in, to me in, about this. In part, that is true. Um, we still use them, but consultants don't drive the strategy. Consultants don't drive the execution. People who are the funders and representatives of funders, whether it be institutional or individuals, drive that. So, the, you know, consultants are part of a team. So do we have media people doing buying? Absolutely. But we have, you know, competitive bidding for who gets this kind of work and negotiated very low commissions with an understanding, no, you do good work with us, then, and you keep your pricing competitive, then we'll keep using you, or at least give you a chance to compete. But those people are not the ones who are steering the messaging, no. steering the ship, no. steering the multi-year strategy. No, it's the people who want to win. When, it, ta it takes time, and how, it takes how did you How did you go from what it was before when Democrats weren't winning to that? What was the key ingredient? Uh, turning to people and say, do you want to win or not? You know, at that point, the entire state was red, like red, red. And, yeah, it was and beautiful. It was, it was and a wonderful it was wonderful drifting state. farther and farther right. And at some point, you have to stand up and say, this is, you know, enough. 
Um, and what you do is you don't go out and get consensus. You get a group of people, a group of funders that really want to win. You develop what a plan is, and people can either jump on that train or not. But it also takes a couple heavy hitters. When we talk about Tim Gill and Pat Stryker and Bridges and even Polis to a certain extent, that primes a pump. And as much as I know good guys on the right who have put in a lot of money, none of them touch the levels that your guys have. Well, one, I can't talk about yes, that, you can. That, that part. Of course you um, can. There are various individuals. Just between us. No, there are various individuals that are involved in this now. We have developed a pipeline, and so it's no longer dependent upon you know two or three. Um, there are always varying levels of what individuals will, will spend. But what's important, and the key, at least here in Colorado, is this is aligned with institutional spending and individual spending. And we all agree it's about winning. What, if, if, what do you mean if, institutional and individual? You're talking so about like, the teachers union and right, Tim teachers Gill union, or, or Pat Stryker. Teachers union, you know, a group of individual donors, um, the environmental movement, trial lawyers, uh, and there is an agreement. It's about winning. How did you get it so that the rich guys and those interests, instead of listening to the consultant class, ended up listening to guys like you and Al Yates who, who put together a system? Because there's nothing here that says you, you, know, you were the guy. It's not, like you had, you, it's not like you had a consultant company and you were just making money off of every contract that it was. Um, I, I think there are two reasons why it, it worked in the beginning and still works today. People that are advising funders are not also making money off of what's happening. You know, and there is a clear understanding that you know, the, the, the people that are helping coordinate and align all this activity and making sure it's all just about winning, those people then also aren't out there then doing the media, doing the mail, doing the field. Um, because that, that skews decision making. No matter how often that person says, oh, no, 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 it's not going to influence what I'm going to recommend to you, at, at some level it does. And, you know, if you're not saying that when the people you, when you who are building the strategy. It, whether you have institutional um, investors or individual investors, and I view it as investing, because you're right. investing yeah. and winning, um, most of these folks are pretty sophisticated. And they've been around the consultant block. And they know, you know, not the game, but just how this all operates. And you, you don't have to have it that way because it, it's the wrong incentive. Let me, you, you used a word here that I use as well, which, and I'll, I'll lay it out why I think my team loses. You said we call it investing. The Independence Institute, we call it investing. I think many people on our side see it as an expense, not an investment. Oh that they see, oh my God, Polis is going to become governor. You know how bad that's going to be for my industry or this or that? And they go to consultant, what's it going to take? And the consultant says, this much. Oh, crap. They write a check as if they're writing a check for their auto insurance. You know, they're like, I can't believe it's this right. high. Get the job done. Whereas the, the exact same people will give their money to the church to build a new, uh, a new facility for the future. They will give to the hospital to build a new wing for the future. They'll buy a building on a campus to help future <laughs> generations in the future. Those are investments that they make, and they give it with glee. They give it with joy. But when it comes to political change, they don't see it as an investment. They see it as an expense. And my and, sense and is... And they lose. My sense is your investors see it as an investment, not an expense. And it's sustainable. Now, obviously, it goes up and down based on the cycle, but it never goes away. I mean, there's a mix, an alignment of philanthropic money with political money. And, you know, it, it depends whether you're in an odd number year or an even number year as to what the mix of money is and the type of activities that you need. And you have to have, and I know it's kind of a word that gets overused, but you have to have the infrastructure underneath that carries this along. And it, so you don't reinvent the wheel every election cycle. And that's what our side does all the time. They think they're building infrastructure, but they change course every two years, and so we don't build the m momentum. Well, yeah. I, I also think you have a messaging problem, and that is you have 
Republicans that are Trump supporters and the Republicans that don't that are more ideological and until you figure out who the Republican Party is going to be and it's really difficult because what Trump means is defined by him I mean there isn't an ideology it changes, there. it changes every day as well um, you know so it's essentially what the autocrat says and that is going to be very difficult to build a party big enough in order to compete in states that are competitive. Now, if it's a really red state, they're only going to get redder. And that's what we're seeing now, because you're just driving up that base. But in places like here, we will have a better chance of winning, because you know that the middle that you're trying to get doesn't respond to you know, the, the type of autocrat that Trump is. And if that's what the Republican Party gets defined as, you're going to have a difficult time in competitive states winning. Let me throw it back in your face on that one, which is, you're right. We're not that. But we're also not what we saw in 2013, with a bunch of gun grabbing, change the elections, change uh, energy mandates. We got it, and we're just going to shove it down your throat. Uh, recalling three uh, of your senators was a joyful event. Right. And I was thrilled to play a, a sizable role in that. Um, I have a hard time feeling that this new progressive majority uh, coming in uh, is is going to be able to 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 not do what they did in 2013. Right. Matter of fact, I worry that sometimes many on my side are just kind of waiting. Well, you know, let's wait till they overplay it. Um, I have a hard time seeing them not overplay it. The difference this time is all of us still have scars from the recalls, and that was a bitter experience. That was a beautiful and experience. What I think a, a number of us, a number of folks within this world learned is there has to be moderation and I think you're going to be a little bit surprised in terms of where leadership is, where uh, Governor Polis is, in terms of what the policy agenda is going to be. It's going to be some, some things that you don't like, but there are going to be things that pull well within Colorado. But I don't think you're going to see this wave of left uh, start happening. Now, there will be bills like that because each legislator can introduce five, you know, and you can't necessarily control what those are. So you're going to see it. But we, I think we have very effective and going to be effective leadership that's going to calibrate this in a way, understanding that the way we maintain majorities is that you actually reflect where Colorado is. And Colorado is still pretty much a 50-50 state that leans blue. I, I, I see it as, as the coming California. And, <laughs> um, and even if it doesn't happen necessarily through the state legislature, there are 4,000 other governments here that are, are getting more wackadoodle all the time, from putting green roofs and gardens on top of your rooftop to taking away your straws and outlawing your, your soda. You know, sooner or later, people, people feel it, and it's, it's a gut feeling. So, oh, so, so we don't want to increase you know, pl plastic in oceans. That's a wackadoodle idea. There are no plastic straws thrown away in Colorado that will find their way into the ocean. We don't do that. They get interned here. No turtle will ever get a Colorado straw up its nose. <laughs> if, you, if you can fight that one, I will, I will gladly be corrected. But why be putting it in landfills? I mean, it, it's just like it's an added space, and it's always there. It'll never break down. The difference we don't is, have to get caught up on straws. So. The difference is the larger strategy of who's in control. Under the control every aspect of our lives, including whether or not we use a stupid little straw, and that becomes a public policy issue. The issue is, if you guys can't convince me not to use a straw, you're going to do what liberals do. You're going to use the coercive power of the state to take away the choice. This is your nanny state. It is. Here we go. How is it not the nanny state? <laughs> really? So. So you know so much about me that my son, who has Down syndrome, who really could use a straw, shouldn't be able to get a straw in, yeah. in, in a I store because point. you know better than me <laughs> because that's what progressives do. And sooner or later, that might push over even more so than gun grabbing. I have a tough time seeing that. Um, you know, the, the, the policies that fall within that category um, are policies that poll really well. And it's where, you know, the majority of the public is. When you get to something around, guns and abortion are just two issues that because of how they've played out, and it's basically Supreme Court decisions saying, no, this is how it's going to be, without having an underlying momentum, education buildup um, under it, it's always going to be polarizing. I'll just, I'll just say this. If these issues poll so well, you don't need 
banning. You don't need control. You are convincing people. You don't need to outlaw smoking. People are, are turning away from that. You know, what's so odd is that progressives on the right side of my mind are saying, you have a right to smoke pot if you want to smoke pot. But you don't have a right to smoke a cigarette? Because you guys know so much better than we know who's, what, what is right for other people. So what I love about this is that since you guys got a shellacking in this last election, you, now, you. You, you now want to talk about nanny state. Have you know me, you've known me for years. Have I not talked about nanny state? Oh, all the time. All the time. Trust all me. Time. No. And on our issues, let me ask you, we have just a minute or so left. On the issues, largely we still voted like Coloradans. We voted against no, taxes. True. We, uh, we voted against all, all sorts of uh, silly ideas like banning fracking. I mean, I give, you, I give you the left credit. They've changed the vernacular. What was a fracking ban back when the governor proposed it, uh, Governor Polis, is now just a setback, even though it's a worse proposal. Right. So, but but it's, still, it's still there. I, I, I still think uh, on the issues, they voted like Coloradans. On candidates, they voted like Californians. Am I wrong? Uh, you, are, you are wrong, and because on a number of these issues, let, let's take the setback initiative. The setback initiative came from the far, far left of the environmental movement, and the mainstream environmental movement, you know, they don't want to spend political Let's capital. remember, your guy pushed something worse than this one four years ago, so he must also be on that extreme of the left no, environmentally. No, he, he opposed the ballot initiative, the setback ballot initiative. What about the one he proposed four years ago, which was worse? He did support that one, didn't he? Uh, that's true. And we tried to work out a compromise around it. Yeah. There were lessons learned. I'm just saying, you, lessons need, learned. you need to say he's as far left as Oh, fire. Lord, no, 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 no. No, you're going to be Not very, you are going to be very surprised about that. All right, 20 seconds left. Go ahead two years. Does Cory Gardner win re-election here? He has a tough race ahead of him. Who, he's, he's hard to beat, though. And who, who is likely best to beat him, if you were to put that one person there? Right now? Mm -hmm. Michael Johnston. Interesting. Ted, always fun. Thank you so much. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. Read me in the Denver Post. Check out the Independence Institute. We'll see you next week.